Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Clinton Center. I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. Thank you all for joining us here today for this very timely and important conversation about the significant gains that women and girls have made and the gaps that still remain since the UN Forum, UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995. It was at that event where Secretary Clinton, then the First Lady of the United States, said that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. Earlier this month, on March 9th, the No Ceilings Full Participation Report was released at an event in New York City that featured Secretary Clinton, Chelsea Clinton, and Melinda Gates. Today, our very distinguished panelists will localize the data and information gathered in the report so that we can all work together towards full participation here in Arkansas. Before, we'd like, before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank our friends at the Clinton School of Public Service, in particular Nikolai DePippa, who runs the public programs here. The Clinton School is a great partner. And the school continues to be a tremendous resource for our community, and I'm so grateful uh, for the difference that the Clinton School students are making here in Arkansas and around the world. Now I'd like to welcome our moderator, my friend and colleague from the Clinton Foundation, Terry McCullough, the director of the No Ceilings Full Participation Project. Terry actually joined the foundation from the Tory Birch Foundation and previously served as chief of staff, advisor on women's issues, and, another of, and a number of other significant roles in the office of Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader of the United States House of Representatives. Terry has a wealth of experience in the nonprofit sector, which is really focused on empowering women, ensuring that they have the resources they need to improve their lives. And joining to Terry today, as I mentioned, is a very distinguished panel. Marcy Doderer, who many of you know is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Arkansas Children's Hospital. Scott Shirley, the Founder and Executive Director of KIPP Delta Public Schools. Beth Keck, Senior Director of Women's Economic Empowerment for Walmart, and Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, the Chief Executive Officer of the YWCA USA. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists to the stage and my friend Terry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. We are thrilled to be here and are so grateful to Stephanie, to the CPC, to the Clinton School of Public Service, and all the team that helped us uh, put this event together today. We are thrilled to have such incredibly distinguished panelists talking with us about the full participation of women and girls, not only here in the US, but very specifically here in Arkansas, and then globally as well. We are uh, just about at the end of Women's History Month. I think women are making history every day, but they actually give us an official month to uh, celebrate it. So we took that opportunity in this Women's History Month to release the full participation report, uh, noceilings.org, and the full participation plan. This is a data report on the status of women and girls and a roadmap to full participation that has been a year in the making, but its genesis goes back even farther than that, as Stephanie mentioned. It was at that Beijing conference uh, on women that almost 200 countries made a commitment to the full participation of women and girls through a variety of different issue areas, one you could imagine affect all of us, uh, ones you could imagine affect all of us daily, health, education, economic participation, um, girls and all of, all of their needs, uh, women's political and civic participation, women in the environment, uh, women and violence, uh, women and peace and security, so many different issues. So Secretary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton felt that as we reach September 2015, which marks the 20th anniversary of that Beijing conference, it was time for us to take a very clear-eyed look at what countries, what individuals, what communities had accomplished in terms of the status of women and girls. So we partnered with Melinda Gates and the Gates Foundation and spent the last year culling much data 
um, we, we learned a lot. One of the things we learned immediately are, is that there are significant data gaps. There is a lot we don't know, even though we think so much of this information is at our fingertips. We are really missing a lot of information specifically on women and girls and gender disaggregated data. But we did learn that um, we've made progress and that there is progress that we have to celebrate. A uh, couple of, of areas of progress to note is that when you look at the span of the last 20 years in the area of health, maternal mortality has decreased by almost half, which is not enough, but is really significant in terms of the health of women and women giving birth. Yet, the, you know, the, the health story is one, like many others, that is complicated because even in high-income countries, poor women have less access to health care than uh, wealthier women do, so that's still an issue. We can celebrate the progress in the area of education. We have almost closed the gender gap in access to primary education. More girls are going to school than ever before. Yet again, the story is complicated because in the realm of secondary education, many girls stop going to school. As girls progress, women outnumber men in universities in the US, but there are still fewer women and girls in STEM education, which provides some of the highest paying work as we know now. Here's an interesting statistic, which is, was rather shocking to me, is that in, in 2010, women earned approximately 18% of all computer science bachelor's degrees, which was down from 37% in 1984. So we've really gone backwards in terms of girls in science and math and education. Briefly, in the economic sphere, here are the challenges. We don't have progress to report. Women's labor force participation throughout the globe has stagnated. And overall, in almost every country, women learn, earn less than men. Fewer than three in 10 countries have laws prohibiting gender discrimination in terms of hiring and pay for women. And we think sometimes these are global challenges, but uh, one interesting statistic, one that, that we always find surprising, is that every country but nine, and one of those nine countries is the US, provides for paid leave for mothers with infants. One of the ways in which uh, we can ensure more women are engaging in full participation is that we pass laws to protect them and then we, we enforce those laws. And it helps too that women leaders are at the table to make those laws. Yet the story there is, although almost twice as many women hold political office as did in 1995, they still occupy only 22% of national legislatures. And while the percentage of women CEOs in 1995 was zero, now it's 5%. So we have progress, we have progress we can celebrate, we know progress is possible, but we know there is much more to do. We're not there yet, as the video said, but we know that we can be if we work together. In addition to using data to guide our work over the last year, we are committed to highlighting specific solutions that we know have worked to close the gender gap. And we've also spent a lot of time having conversations like these, not only to hear individual stories that both illustrate this data and inspire us to make change, but really hear from individuals, from institutions, from communities, what works to know whether we can replicate these effective solutions to ensure more women and girls are fully participating. We know that the progress we have seen is because of dynamic leaders and dynamic solutions. So we're excited to hear today on some of these issues that we've covered in the report from some really dynamic leaders. Marcy Doderer, as noted, is going to speak to the status of women's health here in Arkansas. Scott Shirey is going to talk about the status of girls' education here in Arkansas. We have from Beth Keck the private sector uh, perspective on women's economic participation. And from Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, we have the nonprofit organization perspective on women's economic participation. So we're excited for them to share a little with you and would certainly love to hear from all of you and to hear some questions as well. And we'll start with Marcy. Thank you so much, Terry. I think when you think about health for women in Arkansas, I'd ask that you first start um, by thinking about the health of children and girls in particular in Arkansas. There's four kind of key points in the life cycle 
of a young woman that impact the overall health for her. And unfortunately, though progress is being made across this country and progress is being made in Arkansas, Arkansas's pace of change and progress is much slower than that of the rest of the country. And therefore, we continue to fall behind in some of these important health statistics. Start first with the young girl. Unfortunately, in our state, child maltreatment and children at risk is a huge piece of the, fa of the face of health care in our state. 16 out of every 1,000 girls in our state are physically abused compared to nine across the country. And when you think about sexual abuse, really the most vulnerable point in a young girl's life, one in five children in our state are sexually abused. There are solutions, there are processes that we're looking at to help with that, but I think that's the point I would start with that puts a girl in a different frame of mind for the rest of her life. Take her into her early teen years, and Arkansas is faced with a huge challenge of both teen pregnancy and teen births. Those statistics are different. They're often confused, but they're, they are different. We um, unfortunately have the highest teen pregnancy rate in our country and our fourth highest with respect to teen births in our country. And if you think about the profile of that young mom, she's often less than 20 by definition, rarely has a high school degree, is often a smoker, is not married, and is much more likely to be a minority. In Arkansas, 11 babies a day are born to what I would say babies, young girls. So young girls who have babies, unfortunately, contributes to another statistic, the fourth, on infant mortality. The number of babies who die within their first year of life. Again, a startling statistic for Arkansas and unfortunate. Seventh highest in the United States, and two um, young black babies are two times as likely to die in their first year of life than a white baby in our state. That, that mom profile that I just gave you is what part of what contributes to high infant mortality in our state. And lastly, there's maternal mortality. So the mom who dies, I believe it's within the first 42 days following the birth of her child. Don't hold me to the actual date count, please. It's probably in the report there, right, Terry? <laughs> um, those statistics are actually harder to track. They are tracked by many organizations across our country. But in Arkansas, there is not a regulatory requirement to report a maternal death as a death related to um, post-pregnancy issues. So we do code it in our state, but it's not 100% reliable because the regulations do not require it. And that number, as stated or as reported in Arkansas to date, though, is on the rise, quite unfortunately. And I think it is well beyond 16 deaths per thousand moms in our state. And racial and socioeconomic disparities contribute significantly to that, with black women be, being three times more likely to die from a um, post-pregnancy issue than a white woman in our state. There are solutions that we can address as a community. Um, access to health care is really a local issue, and involving the local communities and local agencies is the best place to start. We need improved access to family planning services, improved access to prenatal care and primary care in general, parenting education like a home visiting program, and care coordination for the high risk patient, the parent or the child who might not understand how to navigate the health system and therefore is at higher risk for a bad outcome like infant mortality or, or um, mother mortality. Fantastic. Now you, we, we have all heard that women are the chief consumers of health care. So presumably they would be armed with the tools that would allow them to make the right choices for them and their family. What would you say about the state of resources that are available for them actually to access those kinds of tools? I think the resources like that exist in our state but can, um, can certainly be improved. Healthcare really is an industry where women can lead. Over 75% of people who work in healthcare are women. Um, we have a slightly better average of female CEOs in healthcare. I think is heading towards 20% rather than 5% of hospitals in our country are led by women. Half the students in, enrolling in medical school next fall will be women. We really have an opportunity to impact the face of women's health and female child health across our country by actively participating in that as a profession and as an advocate and as a leader. Um, I, I would add that I think healthcare, uh, specifically as an industry, is trying very creatively to address the access issue. Where can a person gain information to improve their health? 
it's hard in a rural state like Arkansas, our distribution network of hospitals is, is imperfect at best, as well as clinics and doctor's offices. So creatively seeking ways to partner across counties and across communities to gain access, so women can gain access to information so that they can be um, the decision maker for healthcare for their families. Great, thank you, Marcy. So Scott, I mentioned that we really have closed the gender gap in access to primary education throughout the globe, and I know you have some great progress, but also challenges to share right here. Absolutely, we'll start with some of the good news in, in Arkansas. Last year, just looking at AP exams, uh, female students took 5,000 more exams than men in Arkansas, which is, is a great sign that they're working hard, taking risks, because you don't sign up for an AP class unless you want to work harder, unless you want to achieve. Uh, nationally, there's about a point difference on the ACT between uh, boys and girls, boys scoring uh, about a point higher nationally. In Arkansas, that difference is only two-tenths between uh, boys and girls. And then when we look at uh, high school graduation rate, 81% of girls graduate in four years in the state of Arkansas versus 75% of boys. So again, another positive sign. And then last, I think the most promising is that at all four-year public and private universities in the state, uh, with the exception of one school, women graduate at, uh, from those schools at a higher rate than the school average and then their male counterparts. So what does that say? That females in education are, are pushing. I think the other side of the story, though, is where we're not there yet. Uh, despite so many more young ladies taking the AP exams, the scores of young men still continue to be higher. Um, when we take a deeper dive on the ACT, we see a gap uh, when 24 percent of boys in Arkansas are college ready when you look across the um, the four major categories in ACT versus 20 percent for, for young ladies. And then when you dive into race too, we see a, a different story as well. At every four-year institution, um, African-American females graduate at a lower rate than other females. Hendricks is the only exception, interestingly, in the state. <clears throat> and then, so what does that mean? If they're graduating at a higher rate, when they get out of school, what's happening? Well, first of all, uh, in our own congressional district, women earn only 75% of what men earn. Uh, and Arkansas has the sixth largest pay gap in the country. In Arkansas, women own just 25% of businesses. And this one, to me, is the one I'm passionate about. And 82% across the country, 82% of teachers are female in elementary education. Seventy-six percent of teachers ac across the board are women, as you would predict. But then uh, we only have 20 percent of superintendents in the state who are women. So again, it's this theme that women are doing the hard work, but we find men in the, in the leadership positions. Uh, it gets a little bit worse from here. So uh, when you get into college, <laughs> It gets worse, unfortunately. Female faculty chairs at colleges in Arkansas make $134,000 versus $191,000 for men. And of all the four-year public and private colleges in the state of Arkansas, we only have one female president, and that's at Arkansas Tech in, in Russellville. So there's obviously, and then why? Only 17% of legislators in our state are female. So there's some real challenges. And, and for me, so that's the data, but what do we do with that? And again, for me, the theme that rises up, we have women at a younger age taking harder courses, taking more AP, graduating at a, at a higher rate from, college, from high school and from colleges, but yet when they get out the door, the opportunities don't seem to be there. So I'm really fortunate to be part of an organization, KIPP, uh, which is, I think, very progressive. Um, and this month, they put out a, a blog in honor of Women's History Month and had female leaders across the KIPP network answer some questions. So rather than me tell you as a man what the solution is to this problem, <laughs> I thought I would actually uh, get some good quotes from women leaders around, around KIPP. And I think it's two parts to this. I think 
how do organizations change to, to have female leaders and what can females do to uh, push the envelope as well. So the first one, what advice would you give an organization that wants to attract and retain more female leaders? Uh, love this quote, listen to the women in your organization. Appreciate their leadership style, their way of knowing, their perhaps non-conformist choices. Recognize that when strong, opinionated women come to the table as candidates, they are strong and opinionated, not harsh or brash. My wife and I have this conversation all the time. <laughs> because we have a little four-year-old who, right, was like, we're very careful not to use the word bossy. <laughs> because she was bossy and a young male of her age is assertive. And so those, lang those language matter matters at a young age. Uh, another quote answering that, you have to make it okay to be a woman, a pregnant woman, a mother, a wife, a single woman, just as work environments are accommodating and welcoming for every facet and phase of a man's life, they have to be the same way for women. So that's an important piece too. Uh, another question, you can go to, by the way, if, if you want to see all the quotes, go to blog.kip.org, a lot of wonderful information. Uh, next question, did you ever have a lean-in moment that was a crucial point in your career? If so, what was it? I accepted a position to become CEO of a company even though I had never run a company before. Embracing the opportunity and putting myself out there pushed me way beyond my boundaries and challenged me in every way possible. It was hard, but I emerged from the experience with a true understanding of myself and belief in what I could do. So again, when we think just connecting the themes, right? People, women have to be willing to take risks. When they're offered the top job and they don't think they have enough experience, take the risk. Uh, another one, I had just finished reading Lean In when I decided to apply to be the COO of uh, KIPP North Carolina. I thought to myself, I can do this job, but it might be too early in my career and I might not be fully qualified. Even with doubts, I applied and am grateful for the woman who took a chance and hired me. And then the last, to uh, the last question, what was the best career or leadership advice you ever received? Love this, if an opportunity presents itself, don't pass it up. It served me well, in fact, I came to KIPP by following that advice. Uh, and then the last quote, impossible is nothing from the super female superintendent from KIPP Houston Public Schools. So again, I think thematically, right, women are working hard uh, they're pushing, they're taking the harder courses, they're graduating at the, right, right, at the right rates, but we have to get more females in educational leadership. Thank you, Scott. Both Scott and Marcy have raised these issues of the importance of leadership and also the challenges of cultural and social norms in terms of uh, uh, enabling or not enabling women to fully participate every day. Um, Beth, uh, having just come back, I think, from both China and India, or from China, um, has a perspective that, that shows that uh, the full participation of women and girls from Walmart's point of view makes good business sense. And one of the messages that we are trying to share with this report is that not only is investing in women and girls the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. I'd love for you to talk about that. Sure. And actually, though, I'd like to do a little divergence to Arkansas before I talk a little bit about what's going on in India and China from our business perspective. Um, I was struck by your statistics about, you know, uh, women's participation from a political point of view. And you know that one of the things as women, you know, we're told that doesn't happen is that you don't put yourself forward. Well, I read this great column in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette probably about this time last year about how women were so underrepresented on state commissions and the you know, appointments you know, that are made at the governor's level uh, throughout you know, different commissions uh, across the state and boards. So I said, okay, I'm, gonna be, I'm not gonna be one of those people that's, that's, you know, that's just uh, reads it and nods, I'll put my name in. So I went to the governor's website and I found the place where you put your name in and your whole resume and all of that. And it was a great reminder that just putting yourself forward is not enough because I just got rejection letter after rejection letter <laughs> and continued to just see more male appointments. 
And it was a real reminder that, yes, you can be a very qualified person for uh, some of the, these positions, but you also have to have advocacy in order to, to break through. And, um, and so that was a, a great reminder of, of that. Now, in my regular life um, at Walmart, I work on women's economic empowerment every day, and in particularly a portfolio where we're focused on training a million women around the world in workforce and agriculture to have more opportunity. And as Terry said, I just spent two weeks uh, in, first in India and China and Beijing, so I thought it was really appropriate to be flying in from Beijing to, to, talk of, to be able to talk today. And there were three themes that were in this report that really resonate with our work and the work that we do each day. One of them was just women's access to employment, and you heard the statistics from Terry about women's participation in the formal workforce. And in India, you think of retail as a women's business here in the United States, lots of women involved, and in fact, our statistics globally uh, relate to that. But in India, if you look at the formal sector and in retail overall, only 10% of the workers are women. And so we're working, for example, with the Self-Employment Women's Association, a very large women's association, to take workforce training, particularly in retail skills, down to women so that they can actually have a credential that they can walk into a store and to be able to present themselves as having that opportunity with the hope that this type of effort will start changing those statistics uh, little by little so that it provides another access route for women in India for opportunity. In China, uh, well actually just another bit on, on uh, South Asia, which was emphasized in the report, was this idea of the second shift, that women spend a lot more of their time, particularly in some parts of the world, even still in the United States, but other parts of the world, even more hours on, even if they are in the workforce, on the work that they're doing at home. And we find that too in the work that we're doing. We have programs with factory workers, both men and women, but with a focus on women. And the idea is that actually with small amounts but targeted training, you can actually change mind shift, you can shift mindsets. And the idea there is to start getting these mind shifts sh shaped and changed at the factory level to increase the value for the work that women are doing. I've walked through many factories in my career, and inevitably you'll see lots of women on the line and very, very few, if, and sometimes zero women at all in management. And so through women's programs that are focused on factory workers and on management as well, we're working to try to, to make some of those shifts happen. And so this is a program we've had underway now for two years. And part of that is also empowering women to talk to their spouses or partners at home about the workload that they have at home. Uh, because without changes there, sometimes it's just really difficult to get to work on time. If you can't get work on time, then your opportunities for advancement are stunted by just fundamentals. The third thing that really resonated uh, with me as I read the report and the work we do is just ac access to assets. And we have really looked at that in the area of um, agriculture. And when you look at women's access to better seeds and better fertilizer, and even the extension services, women do not have the same opportunity today. And so it, we've put in place uh, programs in the area of agriculture that are specifically focused on women. And it was amazing that when you asked the question of, oh, how's this program doing with the women in the community, uh, you know, we learned the, about the, the lack of access. And that through focus programs, for example, we have a project in Bangladesh with USAID. And we went to them and said, you know, we really want to invest more in women. And they said, oh, we have this great program for rice and improving the fertilizer placement of rice rather than scattering it so that it improves productivity and livelihoods. And we said, that's great. How many women are uh, impacted? Oh, rice is a men's crop. Well, we said, where are the women? It turned out that women are doing the vegetable gardens and vegetables that are, are closer to the home. And so we came up with this great partnership where we took this ready-made technology 
that could be applied to the women's crop. And so 40,000 women through a, actually a quite modest investment have been impacted to have improved livelihoods. So we really believe that focusing on women makes a huge difference. Because um, if you improve the life of a woman, all of the research shows that you improve education, you improve livelihoods for them personally, you improve nutrition. There are many, many benefits that come. And that in terms, really in the end, improves society and improves consumerism in society. So I'll stop at that from Arkansas to China to India. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Beth. And, and you talk about the impact. And, and one of the things, again, we, we focused on in this report is how none of these issues or activities live in a silo. Each impacts the other significantly and often is a, is a determinant of, of your uh, success or ability to get a job. And Dara, with her work at the YWCA, certainly knows how all of these issues so impact uh, the economic empowerment of women and girls. Yes, and um, certainly I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the YWCA. We serve more than two million women and girls across the United States and the District of Columbia. And ironically, we don't have a YWCA in Arkansas. We need to fix that. We're going to see what we need to do about. But we're really a dynamic grassroots organization um, committed to social justice through action advocacy. And we're the 25th largest um, organization and nonprofit in the United States. Uh, we do have a worldwide YWCA, and which serves more than 25 million women in 120 countries. So in small towns, uh, in major cities across the United States for well over a century, women have come to the YWCA for many reasons. Uh, and they continue to come to our YWCA. But more importantly than them coming, when they leave our organization, our goal is to make sure that they are empowered with a renewed spirit, with new skills, um, and the courage to healthy, safe, and much more productive lives. It's important to note that probably 78% of the women that we serve have incomes that are below the federal poverty lines. And that's equivalent to about 23,000 or 800 a year for a family of four. So addressing the needs of these women is, is very, very challenging. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the scale and scope of our work, um, nearly 300,000 individuals participate in our racial justice education and training programs annually. More than 350,000 women participate in our health education and wellness programs. More than 250,000 women benefit from our economic empowerment and workforce training programs. And we have over 100,000 children and youth who are building their futures in our daycare, our after school, our STEM programs. And we provide nearly 500,000 women with services including counseling, financial literacy, housing, and safe shelter from domestic violence and sexual assault. And, and one of the ways that we achieve our goals is by working collaboratively with public officials to shape policy and legislation designed to improve uh, communications and, and provide equal opportunities for women and girls. Because at the YWCA, we're very confident that inspiring a new generation of leaders and advancing women's equality, it's not just a nice thing to do. It's, it's central to creating a brighter, more prosperous, productive, and peaceful world. And so we were really excited about the No Ceilings Report, finding that constitutional change has coincided with an increase in legislation protecting women's rights. In fact, more than four out of five constitutions now have some mechanism to guarantee gender equality. And in many countries, laws that once permitted unequal treatment of women and girls now have been replaced with laws that recognize their equality. But still today, in far too many countries, including right here in the US, women's rights and family, civic and economic life are limited. And, and even where strong laws exist, implementation and enforcement are weak. Um, the other panelists spoke about some of the other challenges women face, but I will briefly talk about the challenge of violence against women and girls as the YWCA is the largest network of domestic violence providers in the nation. More than 1.4 million connections for domestic violence and sexual assault 
are made annually at our YWCA's and our organization fought to pass the Landmark Violence Against Women Act and the authorization uh, recently. And as the No Ceilings Report reveals, awareness of violence against women and girls has increased significantly over the past 20 years, but sadly, it continues to be a very pervasive problem uh, and global epidemic. One in three women worldwide has experienced physical or sexual violence, the vast majority at the hands of her husband or partner. The estimated share of girls among the total number of detected trafficking victims has doubled from 10% in 2004 to 21% in 2001. And legal prohibitions against domestic violence are more extensive than in 1995, but significant gaps remain, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East. And right here in the US, one in five women will experience rape or attempted rape during her college years. And while eight in 10 know their attacker, only 13% actually report their assault. Now we all know that domestic violence and sexual assault occur in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. But we also know at the YWCA that financial and the economic empowerment of women contribute significantly to a woman's ability to leave and not return to an abusive partner. And we also know that it's important to provide young men and women with gender socialization trainings early on in their lives. We think that will serve as a very good preventive tool to help them understand what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, and what things should and should not be tolerated. So in closing, the fundamental concepts outlined in the Full Participation Project uh, report Unlocking potential, ensuring security, and creating opportunity for women and girls align perfectly with the YWCA's overall mission to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, freedom, justice, and dignity for all. And, and these concepts are imbued in everything we do at the YWCA and have done for more than 150 years. And you may think I'm biased, but I actually think that women and the YWCA are extraordinary. Um, <laughs> and, and, and truly, certainly, our organization's mission is more relevant now than ever. And, and we're just really pleased to be a part of this and the incredible work that's being done to document where we are and ensure that one day, hopefully very soon, women and girls all around the globe will achieve the full equality and full participation that they deserved. Thank you. So one of the things that, that you and I have discussed in the past, and, and one of the, the great parts of this project has been over the last year, we've been able to highlight the great work of organizations, of companies, of nonprofits that really work um, to expand opportunities for women and girls. But we know uh, nonprofits are often very limited in resources. So how do you face that challenge as you try to uh, uh, work to empower women and girls in all of these areas? Yeah, it, it's really a conundrum. Um, nonprofits are asked to solve some of the world's most challenging problems with the most limited amount of resources. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it's a conundrum. And I just, I've, I've worked in the for profit and the nonprofit world. So think about it. The for profit world, they have the option to select the best talent, they can do the best as it relates to advertising and marketing. Um, they can, you know, do anything that they need to do to turn, uh, uh, get a return on investment, but if a nonprofit dares to go out and uh, pay someone a market rate to do a good job, they're looked at a little bit funny. I mean, imagine that, that you should pay someone a decent salary to save the world. It, it, it seems kind of confusing. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm, this isn't new to me. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you've seen Daniel Pallotta, uh, um in his famous TED talk, I believe, believe it was in 2013, and, and Stanford does a lot on this, but it's, it's very challenging for a nonprofit. When we get advertising dollars, we very rarely can use them because um, people will look at us and say, you're spending too much money on overhead. Well, who can do work without overhead? So it's a tremendous challenge for a nonprofit to try to go out there and do the incredibly life-changing work that we're doing when the culture around nonprofits, I think, is a bit mixed up. We need to have the ability to hire the best talent, to bring in the best resources, to have the best infrastructure so that not only can we come up with creative and innovative ideas, but we can talk about the impact we're having because we have the systems and the infrastructure to be able to demonstrate it. 
So as you can see, I'm a little passionate about that topic, <laughs> but I think it's... <laughs> But I really do think we have to look at nonprofits differently. So the next time each of you want to donate to a good organization, I know a great one. It's the YWCA. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but when you're looking at any organization that you'd like to consider donating to, don't just look at the amount of money they spend on overhead. Look at the change that they are making in the world. Beth, Walmart does have resources, and it chooses to invest them this way and to not just to you know impact the bottom line impact the supply chain but certainly that there there must be a feeling internally both from a, a, a for those who work within the organization as well as those who who buy at Walmart that they are part of of empowering women and girls can you talk a little bit about that how important that is to have that a uh, uh, investment from uh. Yeah, I mean, it's really been interesting. I've worked for the company for 10 years, and 10 years ago, there was not a, a, a social focus with the company. It was very much the tradition uh, of a company view is that the company's role is to uh, service the shareholders. But there was this big change in, in the company, you know, kind of the ship move, and I was fortunate to be there during that, that change. And uh, a better understanding that business and society must uh, interact and that part of the role of business is to look at these big social issues and figure out you know what we should be doing so um, we took a, a firm stand on women in 2011 and that's when we announced our public commitments of what we would do externally in the company but at the same time it never does any good to do things externally if you're not doing things inside the company and I can say that 10 years ago versus today, it's a much nicer place to work in terms of gender diversity. Um, I remember my first you know, uh, couple of uh, big meetings and it's like, oh, where are the women? But I'd come out of aviation and I was kind of used to that. <laughs> but I was surprised in retail because you know, retail as a business has many, many women in it. And in fact, around 57% of our workers around the world, uh, people who are work for Walmart are women. And so through very concentrated programs for inside the company as well, we're doing much, much better and have around 40% of, of women in management. And then though, what you have to do now is you have to fine tune. Um, when I was in China, we were talking about pre-employment retail training and we got into also discussion about women in management in our China business, which is quite good overall. But there's one part of the business where we don't have enough women in management, and that's running our super, store, super center stores. And we start talking about the barriers. It's not because we don't have women who are qualified. Sometimes there are policy constraints. And in China, there's a, a policy called the, uh, the household registration policy, HUCO in Chinese. And you need a HUCO or registration uh, because that's the key to your children's education and access to uh, social services. And so we actually have an issue of having women ready to be promoted to run a super center, but the super center is geographically not compatible with um, their household registration. And they are not going to sacrifice their children's education for taking a promotion. And so that's one of the conundrums that we have um, in terms of uh, you know, a specific situation. Um, but overall, we are working on unpacking those barriers for women that are both in the company and then through our external program externally as well. Because we know that, uh, actually our research shows that we're doing research inside the company right now on women-owned businesses and the products that they sell. And we're trying to go category by category. And some of our preliminary research shows that the products that we sell that are coming from women-owned businesses are selling faster and they are more productive than the products from the big global brands. And so that's the business case. And we're trying to show that business case in all other segments as well. Why do you spend time you know, uh, training 
women in factories, and we don't even own these factories. It's because the social science and economic research shows that if there's less verbal harassment, less and, and no sexual harassment, and that women feel empowered, productivity goes up. The economists have shown that. And so what we need to be doing is investing in those mindsets that then show factory managers that it is much better to have a factory that is addressing these types of issues because productivity does go up. And when you have improved productivity, you have improved livelihoods for the people who are working there. So it goes hand in hand throughout the full supply chain. Scott, you gave us some very inspiring words about leadership. How do you empower girls and boys at KIPP to lead and to achieve their aspirations? Well, I think it, it starts with a simple rule, which is kids first. Um, for us, it's never about what's right for us as an organization. It's about what's right for the students we serve and the people within the organization. So uh, KIPP was built upon this concept more time, as an example, where we had school 7.30 to 5.00. Uh, which was great. So we had kids who were coming in behind and we were to catch them up. But then as we expanded our bus routes, we found uh, that that wasn't working for everybody, those long hours, because we literally were running a bus to Forest City where kindergarten kids would get boarding a bus at like 6 a.m. And so at that point, the model doesn't work because that's not right for the kids. Even though it was the KIPP model, we had to be bold and say, look, I don't want my own five-year-old waking up at, and getting on a bus at 6 a.m. So we changed our school hour to 8 to 4. Although the other schools in the area are going, to, you know, they're all getting to school at 7.30. But you have to do what's right for the people within your organization. If you do what's right for, put the students first and put your people first, your organization will win out over time. And I, I think we have to be unafraid to break down some of those norms and, and be unafraid to change and, and, evol and just unafraid to evolve. And I think when we do that, we, we win. Great. Um, I don't know if you saw Marcy's fantastic piece in the Gazette today about no ceiling. <laughs> and the importance of women fully participating in healthcare. So I would ask you, what is the one thing that you would share with women here today to empower them about their own, their own health? <laughs> I'm usually thinking threes, but okay, I'll try you for can, one. You can do three. But I, I believe um, the best thing that women can do to impact the health care of women and girls in our state is to have a voice. To have that voice as the mother and learning where you can seek out resources, whether it's a home visiting program that helps the, to prepare the preschool or to go to preschool or to help assess the um, likelihood of the abuse in a, in a home to have a voice as part of an active role in the child's education. We know that children whose parents are actively engaged in their education, the children do better in education, and that they have a voice for their own health. Obesity is rampant in our state. Heart disease is the leading cause of death of women in our state. To take a voice for their own health. Healthy women have healthy babies. Healthy babies become really productive um, children in our, in our school system. Educated kids will stay in Arkansas, hopefully, and, and the cycle can continue. So to find your voice and to be willing as a woman to have that voice as a woman, as a mom, um, as a leader in our state. Thank you. And there is no better segue into asking of you whether you would like to use your voice for any questions you have with the panel here. Um, I don't know if we have, do we have a, a microphone? Oh, yeah, right, right over here. How will change come for women and girls when men control the legislature and the legislation they are proposing is just the opposite of what women need? I don't know why I raised my hand as a man. <laughs> <laughs> Let me solve this. Uh, you know, the, the, the legislature is a, is a tricky one, but I might take this from a different angle. Uh, one of the quotes on here that I really like, I didn't read earlier, 
Uh, look at your board of directors. If there are no female representatives on your board, you are sending a very clear signal to potential and current women leaders that you do not value diverse contributions in leadership. And I think it's so important at the, the highest level. So we talked a lot about CEOs, but the, we didn't talk about board of directors. Uh, and I think you have to be unafraid, at least in our organization, this is what we did. We ended up with a male majority and a, and a white majority, and we just established some rules on our board and said, you know, we're not bringing on another board member unless they make us more diverse, unless it's an African-American candidate uh, or, a, or a female. And all of a sudden, we, you know, we added three female board members in the space of six months. And I think it's just leadership being willing to say, you know what, uh, or maybe whatever party it is saying, we need to run females. And we're gonna make some rules for ourselves that X percent of our candidates this year are gonna be female. And people, I think, are, they, they stray away from making those rules because they don't want to appear to be biased or whatever it is. And, and I think it just takes leadership being bold. And there would be nothing to prevent, like I said, either party at the next, at the next election cycle to say, our target is gonna be to have 40% of our candidates be female. And we're not settling for anything else. I don't care if you know, Joe over here is great. We, we, need, to, we need to hold the standard. Um, that, I think that's what it takes, people to be brave. 40. F 50, I'm just, I'm not 60, I'm not. Can, can I I'm, I'm just looking at the number though, 17%, right? If you're at 17% and you would go to, the next, the, the, the next incremental change and build and build from there, absolutely. I want Dara to respond to this, but I want to ask this group, is there anyone here who has either run for public office or considered running for public office? Would you raise your hand? So, the, the, it is said that you need to ask a woman seven times before she will agree to run for office, whereas typically there are men who will run for office because they believe it is a good thing to do and they can make a difference. I am not at all saying that it is only women that can make change for women, but having a diversity of people at the table, as Scott said, is critical. And I think also creating a deeper awareness for everyone, be it men or women, around the uh, 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 urgency of some of these issues and the consequences is critical as well. We're hoping to share this data with as many people as possible because some just aren't, aren't, aren't aware of the numbers right now and aren't aware of the implications. Dara, did you? Yeah, and I was just gonna add, uh, just in response to your question, I would agree um, with Scott that um, bringing on more diversity is important, but I think the reality is we're gonna have to engage the men that are there. Yeah, and we really are gonna have to make sure that, um, you know, Let's just face it, I mean, men are leading many of the corporations, you know, 95% of them are leading the Fortune 500 companies. They're leading our, our, our nation's um, legislative offices. And we have to engage them. And all of them aren't bad, I promise you. I've met some really good ones. Um, so, <laughs> so I think we need to figure out a better way to engage them and help them understand that this is an, an imperative. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, usually the economic argument saves the day. Usually, if you can justify that having more women there, you know, would make a difference. Well, we've done that over and over and over. Um, but there's still no change. So I think it just has to be a culture shift and we need to engage um, the men who are there um, to have them act. And I think we can do that by utilizing our vote and making sure we have the right people in office. That's a great point. So, um, regarding women running for a legislative position, it has to begin in the home first because women are caring for the children, taking care of the home, they're working, so there's got to be a partnership so the woman can step out and run or participate or be part of that legislative body. It begins in the home. They have to have help doing this. They can't keep adding to their plate, okay? We can only do so much. But one of my questions is, the latest thing that I heard about equal pay is that male nurses are getting paid more than women nurses. Now, how can that happen in this country where women have been the nurses for hundreds of years and now men are making more money than women nurses? How can that happen? 
in our country. Can you explain that? I mean, how can that happen? Women, how can that How can we stand for that to happen? How can, how can we stand for that to happen? I don't have a national statistic. Yeah, that's not a statistic I have nationally in terms of RNs per se and the, and the breakdown. I think the, the data is clear that overall, across this country, men are um, paid at a higher level for doing the same job based on the same level of experience. So I would have to think that translates. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not familiar not with that. Not only in this country, issue. but throughout the world as well. Sure. So um, it comes back to leadership in the hiring organizations and understanding that you have human resources practices and policies that disallows a gender difference for hire, that you're, the way you apply your pay practices has to be very prescriptive to um, the qualifications for the job and the, the experience level or whatever your march up is as opposed to gender. So it, it takes di uh, diligence and vigilance, I would say, to eradicate that very specifically. But you're, to your question, regardless of the sector, regardless of the job, why are we standing for a gender pay gap in 2015? Hi, I'd like to say thank you first to Stephanie, Terry, this panel. You have done an amazing job and I have lots of good notes from all that you've talked about. I have a specific question because I think out of everything you said, it comes back to education. Education is the key, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the school, whether it's in the community. So I have a, a question for the KIPP representative. And my question is, I have nothing against private schools or charter schools, but we all know that most of our, especially the poor children and the children most at risk are in public schools. Are you a consultant with the public education department? Do you talk to them? What is the model? Do you share your model with the public education schools? How can you help bring our public schools up to par? because though that is where most of our children are. So I have an uh, answer for that. First of all, at KIPP, we're about 1,400 students between um, Helena and Blytheville right now. Uh, so we represent 30, 40% of the, the community we serve in, in Helena. Uh, and our poverty rates are about 90% this year. We're 11% special education. 11% of our students receive special education services. We're 95% African American. So, first, I would argue that we we serve, you know, children who need us the most, and it's something very important to us. We go into the toughest neighborhoods to to recruit. But the, one of the things that we've been always passionate about is getting kids to and through college. And so we found success with our own kids, and we have a comprehensive process where we we help students with scholarships, we help students with their application, we help register them for the ACT. I mean, we've driven students who don't have rides to college to their first day of class. Um, we have a pot of money set aside for kids who we know $400 uh, that they don't have for books will throw them behind for a semester. We have a pot of money to support them. But one of the things we did this year is we wrote a grant to the Walton Family Foundation for $500,000 and said, let us bring our kid through college program into our neighboring schools. And so instead of just serving our 40 seniors this year, we're serving actually 100, uh, no, more than that, it's about 250 seniors, uh, including ours. Um, and we're going in, we have people in there supporting them. And just at one of the neighboring schools, we went in a week before the ACT and we registered 100 kids for the ACT exam. We're providing them all the same scholarship access. We've actually done joint field lessons <laughs> Um, we've brought in schools like Spelman to, to speak to all the, all the kids in the schools. And I, I think it's just, it goes back to the thing, right? If, if just our kids win, but the community doesn't change, that's, not, that's a losing proposition. And so the big question is, how do we transform our community so it's good for all kids? And the way I think about it is if I'm a kid on the street, and then my neighbor to the left is going to college, and my neighbor to my right is going to college, it makes me more likely to go to college. So I think there are ways to work together on it. So, 
And, and with that, I am sorry we will have to close, but it uh, shows that progress is possible for full participation. We're going to need a lot of collaboration. We're going to need a lot of resources. We're going to need to work together to make that change. Please help me thank this incredible panel. And thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you.